Hello and welcome to the Refugee Welcome Collective Lunch and Learn series. In these sessions, we bring you interesting and timely information um, to you supporters of refugees. Whether you are a volunteer, community sponsor, resettlement agency staff, a local advocate, or just someone who is interested in learning more, we hope you enjoy today's session, Creating a Storytelling Culture in Your Community. This is the third session in a series exploring the value of storytelling in welcoming communities. Um, so if you did not see them, I'd encourage you to view the previous Lunch and Learns in the series. Um, they were the stories we tell and why they matter. And the other was identifying and sharing untold refugee stories. And both of those are available in the Refugee Welcome Collective resource library. Um, a little bit more about the Refugee Welcome Collective. Um, we collaborate with partners to provide in-depth training programs, weekly learning sessions, resources, and on-demand technical assistance for sponsors, practitioners at resettlement agencies, refugees paired with sponsors, community and institutional partners, and others to support quality community sponsorship programs across the United States. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. As a reminder for everyone joining the Lunch and Learn today, there is a control panel in the upper right-hand corner of your screen that will allow you to submit questions through the questions box. There will be ample time at the end of the webinar for Q&A. Everyone on today's webinar is automatically muted. However, if you have any tech in issues, please raise your hand through the control panel or submit a question in the questions box so we can help you. Additionally, a recording will be sent to everyone um, today. This brings us to our presenters. Our presenters are Zainab Abdo. Um, Zainab is from Lowell, Massachusetts. Um, originally from Syria, she and her family resettled in Lowell in 2016. Um, her story has been featured in the New York Times and CNN, and we are very thankful that she will also be sharing a little bit of that with us today. Cheryl Hamilton has devoted her career to advancing more inclusive communities and storytelling. She is the founder and director of Stellar Story Company. Previously, she directed programs for local, national, and international refugee organizations. She is also the curator and coach for the national television show, Stories from the Stage, featured on PBS and World Channel. Cheryl and Zainab, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh my gosh, thanks for having us back. This has been really fun to do this series with you all, and I really appreciate everything you're doing about creating welcoming communities. And I always like any excuse to hang out with Zainab. Zainab, it's so good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for having me. Um, uh, as you mentioned, this is the third in a series, so I know some people weren't able to join the first two. I'm going to give the shortest recap of the first two Great. sessions, um, but invite people who have been part of it or are new that please ask questions in the chat. We can certainly reference things discussed in the other sessions. This is meant to be the sort of wrap up culmination. Um, in the first session, we just talked about really the value of storytelling and how not only does it elevate the important issues that we work with in the refugee resettlement field, but really it's also a vehicle for community building. And we know this, right? We know that stories have been used throughout time to connect people and to build bridges and foster um, really meaningful relationships. And we believe in that deeply at Stellar Story Company. Um, you did mention Stellar Story Company very briefly, if Eric can move the slide. Um, our company um, actually has seven different nationalities on our team. And we work with nonprofits and individuals to elevate stories, create meaningful change through storytelling. What that means for refugee agencies is we help nonprofits share your stories of the important work you do, or we train your staff about the power of storytelling and how to tell a really compelling story. We do individual and coaching for story ambassadors. This is actually how Zayna and I met as I was working with her to help her elevate her storytelling. Um, we create events, we help people host um, fundraisers that might support your refugee resettlement work, and we also create opportunities for stories to be told. Now, some of you met B.R. Khan. He was with us last time um, as our special guest. He was a South Sudanese refugee who lived in a refugee camp for 22 years. I'm really excited because in the time since our last session and this session, his um, performance on Stories from the Stage was just announced. So he will be featured this month, and we'll make sure you get the link to be able to watch his story. But to get back to the last session, the first session we talked about just why storytelling, why is it important? And really at the foundation, what is a good story? So the most important thing to think about is three elements make a great story. There has to be a central theme to every story, some meaning, some major takeaway to the story. There has to be a central conflict or challenge that the story is following, and the story needs to be relatable. Now, 
everybody understands the idea of having a message and a conflict in a theme in a story, but I want to emphasize for this particular series the importance of relatability. As I've said previously, one of the challenges in our refugee resettlement work has been that sometimes we tell stories that seem so foreign and so separate from local residents that we actually don't create that connection with people. And we talked about in the first two sessions, and I encourage you to watch them, how to find stories that actually bring people closer together, shared experiences, challenges with making friends, or challenges in a workplace related to culture, or how, um, how the challenges of finding a job or the job experiences, that those stories actually might create more meaningful relationships between people of diverse backgrounds than necessarily focusing on the most different thing that you might have in common with some, that you don't have in common with somebody. So the first session was about that. The second session is just the importance as refugee advocates of having a toolkit of stories that you can share with others not always relying on the same story over and over again. Not only because you wanna be fresh in your own advocacy, but because in order to be relatable, you wanna have a story library so that you can pull a good story depending on who you're talking to. Some stories are gonna resonate with people differently. One of the things we talked about is how sometimes in the refugee field, we tend to tell too big of a story. We try to tell the entire like, 20 year career we've had or 15 years as a refugee in a camp. Whereas the real magic comes when you pick a specific day or a specific experience that you had and relive that with somebody because then you can really be in the story and really connect with people. So we talked about building a story lab library. We also talked about how not always telling the same issues so I always talk about how refugee employment as we all know is the marker often the emphasis on measuring a good refugee resettlement program. But there are incredibly important stories related to refugee public health or refugee engagement in civic um, participation in, in elections even, or civic engagement. There's important stories even related to transportation. One of my favorite stories ever told by a refugee ambassador in our program was just her journey to her first night on her job as a Burmese refugee, taking three different buses to get to work and what it was like as a single woman new to a country to have that experience. So thinking really comprehensively on the type of stories we tell. And the third thing I mentioned in that session before we get to talking about today is thinking about storytelling as a way to model the behavior change we want in our communities. And what I mean by that is a lot of times we say we want welcoming communities. We want people to be supportive of and um, of new arrivals from different refugee backgrounds. And we talk sort of esoterically up here about that. But people are like, yeah, yeah, but how do you make that actually happen? What does that look like? Well, it looks like telling a story that demonstrates that change you're looking for. So people can understand, oh, that's how I can be helpful or that's how I might not make a mistake and make someone feel alienated. It's an opportunity to model behavior change. So today, that's a little bit of background. You can go learn about those more in the sessions, but today we're gonna to talk sort of institutionally about, okay, but how do I create a storytelling culture in my community and in my, in my nonprofit? Now you might be like, what is she talking about? Storytelling culture? Well, here's how I came to this sort of terminology. You see, I've run refugee programs for 20 years, which means like probably some people on this call, I've also had to fundraise for refugee programs for 20 years. Now, if you know about fundraising, there's this philosophy of creating a culture of philanthropy in your nonprofit. Now, if we were having a dialogue, I'd be like, does anybody know what that means? What that means is that everybody associated with your nonprofit is a fundraiser. From the frontline staff to your volunteers, everybody is trying to create a culture of philanthropy, bringing funding and gifts and goods and volunteers into an institution. And that is incredibly important. But here's what I've learned in 20 years. Culture of philanthropy scares some staff and it makes turns off volunteers because they're like, wait, 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 wait. I just wanted to volunteer. I didn't want to raise money. And your caseworker or your interpreters are like, wait, 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 I don't want to be responsible for like raising money. Like that's the development department. Well, here's the secret, folks. If you say a culture of storytelling, it's the same thing. Because a culture of storytelling is one where your institution, everybody from your frontline staff to your CEO to your board, board of directors are all telling compelling stories that excite people into learning about what you do 
and supporting your mission. Because stories lead to interest and interest leads to engagement. So if you create a culture of storytelling within your institution or in your community, you get to the same goal as creating a culture of philanthropy. And so today we're gonna to talk about, okay, but like, all right, but what does that mean to create even a culture of storytelling? So let's look really quickly at a slide that lists all the different ways that your nonprofit, your resettlement agency, or the partnership you're part of use stories. Because sometimes we think, yeah, yeah, I understand stories are for fundraising, but there's many other ways. Derek, would you jump to the slide that has like the many ways that we use stories at our institutions? Awesome. All right, these should be pretty obvious. We use stories to attract our clients to the places that we serve individuals. When a refugee, resettlement, a refugee gets resettled by an organization and tells a good story about their experience, they tell other refugees and immigrants in the community, which naturally attack, attract people to enrolling in your programs, which is what you want. It's also a way to attract those of us to work in the field. My favorite thing is to talk to students graduating about how working in the refugee resettlement field is one of the most exciting professions to be involved in. As I often say, you never get bored. Refugee resettlement touches on everything from living standards to love. So if you want a interesting field working with incredible individuals and never getting bored and there's always challenges, it's a great profession. And then I tell them stories that illustrate that. It's also obviously a way to get donors, people engaged in your work. It's an important way to get stories out to the media. Um, you're gonna to talk to Zainab in a second, hear from Zainab. Zainab has been featured on multiple media. She's like a media expert now. And it's because the way that she tells her story resonates with people. She's able to connect with um, audiences in a meaningful way. We also use stories to make our events more interesting. So I used to work at the International Institute of New England where I instituted a program called Suitcase Stories. These were stories told by refugees, immigrants, and those of us connected with them and impacted by migration. And we did this to raise awareness, educate the public, raise funding to support our programs, but also just to make our events also more interesting. You could have someone stand up and give a keynote speech for 25 minutes, or you could have like we did, four refugees open a gala dinner with compelling stories that immediately draw people in and see the work that you're doing. We also use it obviously stories for social engagement. Storytelling is also a great way to do professional development. Our organization trains HR departments about how to tell people how to do their jobs through the power of story. And then finally, storytelling to create welcoming communities. And that's where I get to get to my special friend, Zainab Abdo. So Zainab and I met while I was working at the International Institute in Lowell, Massachusetts, where she was resettled in 2016. Am I correct, Zainab? Yeah. September? Is it September? I can't remember. It was May. May. Oh, gosh. See, that's yeah. your flu. <laughs> um, so, Zainab, can you first just describe a little bit about your background, when you came, who you came with for people to know? Yeah. So, hi, everyone. First, uh, thank you for having me here. And I'm so glad like, I'm telling my story here. So, I'm a, my name is Zainab Abdul. Uh, my background, I'm from Syria. Uh, I came here as a refugee. I came here 2016 with my parents and four other siblings. And I didn't know any English. <laughs> so I learned English here, 2016. Um, yeah, this, this is my, a little bit my background. So. Zainab, I remember you and I met at the front desk. I remember very distinctly, you were standing with your whole family surrounding you. I was behind the desk and you and I were using Google Translate to try to at least like connect. <laughs> we were doing our best because our interpreter had stepped out for a moment. Um, for me, it's surreal to imagine that 2016, that's where we started. And now you and I travel telling stories together. Um, so Zainab, very quickly after the uh, election, the Trump election, and then after the um, uh, temporary ban on from immigrants from seven countries, you started becoming very involved in sharing your story. And I approached you and I said, you know, are you interested in talking about your experience? You had been a refugee from Syria. You lived in Turkey with your family for several years, and then you came to the U.S. Why did you say yes? Why did you say you wanted to share your story? Because like, I feel like I say it always, it's my story, it's not only my story, 
it's like whole country like like whole Syrian stories because like everyone's suffering we like everyone saw the war and everyone like want want just to go out you know like see see like the future and I want like really people to understand like how the life over there and how it's everyone it's just not me and because like sometimes in social media they talk about like all Syrian and really like I'm here and I see the like the news I say what they're talking about you know so like some news I like oh my god I was there it's not true mm -hmm. and I really want to like to say the truth first and like to everyone know what it's going the real like and how everyone's suffering how like it just not only all the time I say it's not only my story like my cousins my whole my family like my friends so I just want people to know what what's the real uh, because the people just to see the normal stuff you know they don't they, they, they don't see the the background like are like uh, back that in in that like news or 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 any things they they saw in social media and first they came they was like oh what are you doing here why you are here you know people they was asking me a lot of questions uh how you came here uh and i really want to just tell it to everyone <laughs> and i think it's fair to say you did um uh if you show up to pull up the next slide zainab in her second year in this country, less than the second year, was featured on New York Times. She was featured on the front page of the CNN website. She was featured in every Boston uh, news outlet from Fox News to CNN to NBC to the Boston Globe. Al Jazeera did her special on her family in a video. I mean, you were everywhere. Um, that is quite a welcoming to the United States. How did it feel to be interviewed so often? There was one day in our office that we had the New York Times in our English class. We had set up a, like six, uh, three different studios. We had the CNN room, the New York Times room, the Boston Globe room, and you were rotating through doing interviews with all of them. What was that like for you? It was hard, like, because it's hard to remember what it's like, what happened to us, like, as a family. But I really want to know, like, everyone to know, like, our story, know the truth what happened to us, how we came here. And I I want to say it because first we came, people say, you guys are like terrorists or stuff. And I was just want to show people how we suffered to, to come here mm -hmm. and like how we struggle. And we was kids, no school, like war and believe how the other kids, what they are doing, you know? So it was hard was emotional but I really want to say it and like other my family they couldn't say it my mom she was always like crying you you know <laughs> and I was at the beginning I was so shy to say my stories but I say if I didn't talk who gonna who, who gonna talk who gonna say who gonna like express how we came here and what we struggle and how the war was and how the process how we came here so yeah and those and those interviews were short these were these were stories that were going to be about a minute or two minute coverage because we know that that's what the media um um will will give time to one subject right so in the beginning you learned how to tell your story very succinctly but then as your english advanced and also suitcase stories advanced which is where people stand on stage and tell 10 minute stories you were able to produce a 10 minute story about your journey we don't have 10 minutes to have you tell it, but can you in a few sentences describe what story you chose to tell for suitcase stories? Um, yeah, so I'm actually from Syria and we had normal life. I was living with my parents, with my brothers, my sisters, normal life, nice life. Syria, it was amazing. Mm -hmm. And going to school, coming back and everything started when the election started in Syria, like the war, and first how the people protest. And I was one day in the school and suddenly the school get shut down and I had, I stuck in the school. I was crying. I didn't know what it, what it happened. And, and uh, before that, so we was 
living in rental house for several years uh until we like my father had to collect money like work for a couple of years like just to save money for the house and finally we had our like own house and i was like always saying because i love blue color <laughs> so my father paint like the whole room like the whole house blue because it's my favorite color and the war start 2016 uh we suffered a lot from the war, like skipping from city to city and move from place to place. And the final, we had to skip Syria because my beautiful blue house came bombed. We was at the house that time. So I don't know how we survived, but thanks God we survived. After that, we moved to Turkey and from Syria to Turkey, we had to go from the border because we didn't have any paper like it's long story long story short <laughs> after like nine hours walking to turkey it was hard living in turkey too we don't know that the languages we couldn't study and one organization like helped us like to just to come outside to to turkey and we had like two years process. We was like doing interviews. We was doing like what, like telling stories, what happened to us, how we came to Turkey and why we want to move. And yeah, we came, we came here 2016. Uh, we didn't speak any English. And when we came here, um, actually it was, it was hard. We don't know where we are. We don't know if we're going to have a house. <laughs> <laughs> or or we gonna go to school uh thanks god right now <sighs> we are alive we are safe um i, I like we have our house i did it blue too <laughs> because, like, i where i go it was my like just my dream <laughs> and it came true when i came here and all my brothers and sister we are in college I just graduated last year. I get citizenship. And this is this like short story about how I, how I came here. You're an incredible example of all the accomplishments and all, and they're overcoming so much. Um, I'm smiling every, um, for those of you um, to see why I'm smiling is that Zainab, when she and I started talking about what story she wanted to tell, one thing she really focused in on was this idea of this house, that her father had raised so much money to finally be able to buy a house and that, the pride that that was for their family and then to have that house destroyed and to have to rebuild in the United States a new life and also move into a new house and she has a line that she ends her story when she's on stage which always makes the audience smile where she says the new house is not blue it's gray but it's safe and that's the more important message right that you were safe and you found security as Zainab when you performed um she, so Zainab on, on behalf of the International Institute was speaking to donors she was speaking to media then she agreed to be on stage for 10 minutes and tell your story. Zainab, how was that for you? How was that experience and what did it lead to? Because you kept doing it. You, you said you found it valuable. Why did you find it valuable? Because like uh, saying story is different than like just, oh, like saying in the, in the news, you know? Uh, first, I built a trust myself because I was so shy mm -hmm. and like i couldn't believe i can speak like in in front of all these people and in different language so believe that <laughs> <laughs> and, like i really like work a lot of myself to express my feeling mm -hmm. and to express like my story because it's my story mm -hmm. and even my english was not good but like i say it and people understand me and i say it from my heart so it's different people because like I see people how they look into me, how people like like sad or crying or you know, I, I feel the emotion of people. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so telling telling in the stage, you know, one day you remember I was like one she, one of the uh, girls she was telling her story before me, and I was like shaking <laughs> behind the 
like be, like uh, and she came i say you did great i have to do same yours even she she didn't speak english well i say i really understand everything and i'm gonna do it too that was my first time yep i will never forget there was 350 people in the audience Zainab mm -hmm. was gonna go last because we could she was the first time she'd done this on stage we couldn't imagine anybody following Zainab's story because Syria was so much in the news. We knew it was going to be very powerful. We knew that she's an inspiration. But so Zainab had to sit through six other people before her. And like on one hand, that made you confident. But the other hand, you were getting more, you know, like it was like, I don't know, can I do this? And I remember you turning to me and you said something that for me was really emotional. You said, Cheryl, are they going to care about my story? And I remember thinking, I, I, I promise you, these people came out to hear these stories, to understand and clearly they did how um we're talking today about storytelling as a vehicle for building community can you share one example about how you have felt a greater sense of community or a belonging since you shared your story yeah uh because like after i um, i told i told my story i feel a lot like a lot of support from people i remember when i post uh once i post the video and I was reading the the comments. Oh my God! Like people say, "Oh, you changed my mind." Oh, I was thinking differently. Oh, I didn't know that it's it's going on in your country. Like a lot of support, and like people were saying, "How we can help different people?" Uh, do you know like different people coming? And really, it wasn't like I was shocked. I say like, "What?" <laughs> and I see how people care after how you say it after my story because they was just like they felt me you know and i think they understand how how we struggle mm -hmm. and like the real story mm -hmm. and I, I i always say i would keep doing if uh if it's gonna make a little difference you know mm -hmm. like yeah. in, in the people the people mind so so yeah, Zainab's incredible. She's also being very humble. She, um, if you don't mind me sharing, she uh, recently got married and she is expecting, can I say, can I say? And she's expecting twins, everybody, twins. <laughs> it's it's gonna be a whole new story <laughs> starting in two months. Um, so let's talk about, uh, to the last slide, Derek, if you pull it up. So how do institutions and communities help support platforms so that people like Zainab can tell stories? So here are some really practical suggestions I'd like you to consider as you're trying to build a culture of storytelling in your community. Number one is to do a really honest assessment of what stories you and your institution are currently telling and who is telling them. We tend to fall into a pattern of, of going to the same individuals, either because we think maybe they're the best storytellers or because we think they have the best stories. But what's been really interesting through suitcase stories, and we've worked with over a thousand people now from over 85 countries, is that often it's people like Zainab that you may not initially think, you know, she's still learning English. I don't know if she want to do this. Maybe it's too fresh for her. Like you can have a conversation and pe people will have turned us down and said, no, it's not my thing. But other pre people like Zainab have been, been curious. I'm like, well, let me, let me try this out. Let me see if I'm even going to enjoy it. And Zainab now asks me when she gets to perform next, which is such a, such a privilege and makes um, me really happy that you find it valuable for yourself. So number one is to do a story library assessment um, in your institution. Number two is to actually provide training though about how do I tell a story? Because here's the thing, on one hand, we all say we tell stories all the time. So we, we are naturally storytellers by the nature we're people. But on the other hand, storytelling is still a craft. I mean, Zainab, I, we must have spent eight to 10 hours together working on your story, right? And deciding what parts were the most important to keep, what parts we could you know, use for a different time, how to take a huge multi-year event of your life and condense it down to one theme. So it's important to give people these skills so that they have confidence to go out and tell stories. I know that as a service provider, I didn't get any communications training for the first 10 years of my career. I was told, go talk to donors or go talk on a panel, teach about refugee resettlement, but without sort of that structure. So creating opportunities to do that training. And I literally mean for everybody in your staff, because here's the thing. If right now you took a slip of paper and thought about the five people you talk about most, talk to most in your life, 
maybe it's a partner, maybe it's your mother-in-law, maybe it's your best friend or your colleague at, or your like at your cycling partner. You are telling them stories about your work all the time. You're telling them stories about your volunteering. They are then telling them to other people. So the goal is, is how can you tell the most compelling version of a story, even when you're doing it casually over coffee or at a bar that gets repeated? and is not overwhelming people and is focused on, on the most important message you're trying to say. So two is to do that. The third thing is to then institutionalize that so your organization is collecting stories all the time. If anybody is on here today who's a communications director, I feel for you. I know that you're like, oh my God, I need another story for a newsletter tomorrow. I don't know how to get it. Rather than waiting until the newsletter, to create an institution that is constantly sharing stories is really valuable and creating tools to do that so it's not overwhelming for staff. It's always, it's always interesting to me that I, when I would walk into a staff meeting and say, does anybody have a story, right? People would like glaze over. It's like, I don't have a story. It's because we have so many stories, we're having a difficult time focusing and figuring out which story is the most interesting to tell. Trying to make that part, for example, of a staff meeting. We would have stories every staff meeting and using different prompts each meeting. Does anybody have a story about courage? Does anybody have a story about an unexpected obstacle? Does anybody have a story about a client that you didn't even know was gonna be able to succeed and they blew it out of the water and you're like humbled by their courage? Like then people start thinking of stories. The other way to create a storytelling culture and community is to be really proactive in creating opportunities for people to have chances to tell their story. It's not enough just to wait for CNN or New York Times to call you. We would constantly be in front of the media telling them about individuals and building a ambassador like storytelling community so that we could provide people. But also doing that as a way to build people's social networks. I love Zainab's story purely because she's an incredible storyteller. But to be fully honest, my biggest motivation for having Zainab and BR and our other guests and Ana tell their story is that it builds Zainab's social network, which means the more people Zainab meets, the more opportunities she has in this country or people she knows has because we open doors. So if they meet her, they might have, we've had people in our storytelling program be offered jobs. We've had people be offered keynote opportunities. We've had people be invited to show art galleries, all based on the information that they've included in their story. So when you help someone think of what story to tell, like Zainab, in your own community, ask them what they're looking for and help them make a, create a story that gets to their own goals while also creating a culture of storytelling in your own institution. So that's really important. And the final thing that was the unexpected outcome of suitcase stories when we created our program is that we suddenly had connections in our community that a refugee resettlement agency doesn't naturally always have. We have great relationships with workforce development and Department of Labor and Department of Public Health. But when we started our storytelling program, we started, started, we started getting calls by, by the history centers of Boston, by the Institute for Contemporary Art, Boston's one of Boston's largest arts um, galleries. All these groups that didn't naturally immediately have a connection to our direct service was like, ooh, those stories are really compelling. How can we amplify them? They are less likely to host a panel on a topic of refugee resettlement, but they're definitely excited to feature stories. So you suddenly had these connections that we didn't anticipate. We were being contacted by local, by, um, local community centers in ways that we hadn't been. We had podcast people calling us that were like, oh, we're curious, we hear you have unique voices. Because right now in the space where DEI is finally becoming forefront for all kinds of partners, everyone's looking for really compelling stories. And you as a refugee resettlement partner can provide people with these voices and people like Zainab have their voices amplified and again, grow their social network. So those are five steps that I would start with. Zainab and I are really happy to answer questions either about her specific storytelling or uh, about institutionalizing this at your um, agency. Yeah, no, thank you, Cheryl. Um, and is it okay if we start questions now? Yeah, please. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll go ahead and start answering questions um, that you all submit. And as a reminder, you can still submit questions through the questions pane um, in your control panel. Um, so you can go ahead and start um, providing those. Um, let's see. 
Um, and actually just some um, questions we have mentioned. Um, people were interested in your descriptions, um, Cheryl. So um, we'll remind people that they can find the previous two um, webinars. Um, they'll be in our resource library or they are in um, the RWC resource library on our website. Um, let me see. So that's where you can go for those. Um, let's see, I guess a question, um, and we may have mentioned this also in previous um, series, but um, Cheryl, do you have any suggestions for kind of how to um, reach out to individuals who might be willing to tell their story, um, but also kind of like ask them in a way um, that, that they can say no, or if, you know, what, yeah, right. whether or not they want to share or not, but do you have any advice for, you know, like approaching folks and asking them if they want to tell their story? That's great, and Zainab, I would feel free to share how it felt to be asked and, and your suggestions too. So when we first started 2K Stories, we just had an open event where we said we were gonna teach storytelling so that there was no expectation. So this is another reason to institutionalize storytelling classes. For, so we had a whole group of people come to the center and just learn about storytelling. And based on what I could see happening in the room in terms of interest, also the affirmation of other people in the room telling people that their story was interesting, I think build people's confidence. Through that, then at the end, we said, if any of you are interested in pursuing this, to doing more of this, you tell us. So one way is to not start with the, do you wanna be on the you know, stage with 350 people tomorrow? In right. fact, I, even when I've asked people to identify potential storytellers, I always say it's just a conversation. I tell people not to even talk about stages. It's just like, do you want to share experiences from your life with others? And then we get on the phone. And then as we talked about in the previous sessions, talking about what story you're actually looking for. And as you've heard me say in the past, it's the story the storyteller wants to tell. You may have your own motivations of like, I really want this exact story, but the fastest way to alienate someone is to make it seem like you have an agenda and that your agenda is not to let them tell the authentic story that they want to tell. But Zainab, um, how do you think agencies, some of these people on this call are people that are want to approach individuals like yourself? What works? <laughs> oh, I remember uh, how you trained me, how the story <laughs> works, you know, and you tell me like, actually, uh, you just like give me some motivation just to say it, like to say my story. And really, I like how how we pick when we pick the story it was like you say i really felt it's like very like meaningful like it's it's get to the point uh like to like to approve my story and like everything so i have a lot of different story and i was telling you but like really the most right now the most like the most powerful story it's all the time i say it how you like and i think the training it's helped me a lot like just to know why like how we say it what is the story gonna be about and the point so i think like training it's goes good yeah if um if an agency wants to ask other refugees who have come to this country to consider telling their story what what could they say that would make the person have some confidence that this might be worthwhile to do um like just to understand other people like how I say it it's not only my story like just just ju the story just for people to know the truth and to live the moment with you so I think I think yeah. it's most powerful yeah um, it might also surprise people that are watching that um, it's it's become a running thing that I am fully prepared for someone to who's doing suitcase stories which for that we do in school we do and we even perform for city councils and governments at times but for our big performances that draw four to eight hundred people i expect someone might drop out we're, we're prepared for it because and you have to be okay with that because as we know even those of us who have developed stories from our own times that have been difficult in our lives that there might just be a point that you're like you know what actually i don't want to do this and so you also have to be okay which is why we build a large storytelling community. Now, I will say, even though I'm always prepared for it, it's only happened three times in seven years. Because what ends up happening is what Zainab described earlier, which is that the storytellers themselves become the, um, a community. Seven people meet backstage that didn't know each other from seven different nationalities. And suddenly the thing they have in common is this experience of building each other up and celebrating each other's voices. 
yeah yeah no, they can uh, they can support each other um and i like that thought of kind of building it in um you know that you're kind of prepared to if someone does change their mind um respect that um let's see someone had a question about um storytellers that might not speak um english um have you ever been involved in programs where folks use tra um, translators or interpreters or yeah absolutely we've even had performances where people tell their story in their first language Seriously, my biggest dream, if I can figure out the funding, is I want to do one of those 800 person audiences where the entire audience is wearing the headset like refugees mm -hmm. have to do and that we're all doing the translation in reverse. I just have to figure out the money. So if anybody's a big donor out there wants to <laughs> um, support me in this. But no, we've done it in multiple languages. Um, and I think we need to be doing more of that. And I actually encourage even when someone's doing a story in their second or third language that they use their language within the story. So that people hear other languages, I think it's really important. Um, but Zainab was was correct when she first told her story. Um, was in language. <laughs> she was within 18 months. 18 months of learning English. Was it perfect? Whether was it robust in its vocabulary? No. But the the emotion was so clear, and the nouns and the verbs were so clear that the audience followed you. What's been fascinating for me is after working with Zainab for four years, now when she tells it, it has this even more incredible vocabulary that it's like just keeps elevating. Um, but no, you can do it in multiple languages for sure. Yeah. Um, another question was um, suggestions for sharing stories when people want to remain anonymous. Um, how could you gather um, details without threatening their privacy? Um, uh, absolutely. So if you're telling someone else's story, and we do trainings on this, how to tell stories of others, first and foremost, this might surprise you, um, you're actually telling your story. You're telling your story as it relates to someone. So I've told Zainab's story as my connection with her without identifying her. Now, sometimes I do if I get Zainab's permission, but I can talk about a young woman resettled from Syria who came to this country and I don't have to, the years, the thing about dates, people think dates matter. They actually don't matter unless there's a universal connection for the audience and yourself. So I can talk generally. In the last decade, I worked with a young woman from Syria who came with her family and was rebuilding her life in this country. She had to work two jobs while going to school. I can tell you almost her entire arc with never identifying her identity. Now, if I was worried that her identity, maybe if she was the first Syrian family that resettled to Massachusetts and I could figure out with some Googling people would know, I would just name it from the top of the story and say, for this person's protection, because we know that refugees, even when they resettled to this country are vulnerable, their relatives remain vulnerable. I'm not gonna tell you her identification, but I'm gonna tell you what I remember that's most important. I'm gonna tell you about a young woman who had more courage than anybody I've ever met in her life, that juggled more more uh, school and work and family challenges than anybody should have to. And I can tell you all the most important meanings of her story without telling you who she is. Yeah, and can I, um, Yeah. can we riff on that a little bit? Yeah. Um, there's, the, sorry, there's another question in here um, from someone who says um, they're a refugee themselves and they want to share their story, but they don't want to identify their name or face. Um, how can they do it? So what you were just saying, like they could, um, you know, work with someone else, right? Mm -hmm. Like share their story. And then kind of like you were saying, someone else could help them tell it without identifying. I'm curious though, if you have any other um, thoughts to share with this, you know, person who, like I said, wants to share their story, but not identify their, their name or face. Sure, I mean, there's lots of, um, for example, right now with what's going on with Iran, um, my father-in-law is from Iran, so I've been paying attention to a lot of the, um, the revolution there. There's lots of Iranians in the United States right now wanting to share their stories and their stories of their childhood and growing up and dealing with similar um, atrocities who are worried. And so they're disguising their face, they're disguising, they're using voice um, recorders that, um, or distortion software. So it depends on how you want to share your story. There's writing, there's video, there's podcasts, there's lots of different avenues. And the right producer will help you protect your identity and still get your um, message out there. So, um, but I do know it takes some thoughtful decision about what level of risk um, you're willing to take in sharing that. The thing you can never guarantee, if we're really honest, right, is you can never guarantee entirely that someone else might not on their own figure out who you are and then tell people, ooh, ooh, I know that person. So if you decide to share your story and you're worried about any risk, you wanna make the people closest to you know that you're doing it, why you're doing it, and how it's being done. 
So I have a colleague who works at Stellar Story Company. She's very outspoken. She's Afghani. She, every single time she participates in a media interview about Afghanistan, she tells us when it is, what she's saying, and what she does not or does want us to share. And we try to do our best to respect um, and support her in that. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, no, um, that's helpful. Just the thought that people do have to, uh, to put into it for themselves and others. Um, let's see, uh, this question is um, thanks to um, you all for this session. I'd like to know how you might tackle um, responses from communities that are receiving stories, um, if those responses might be suspicious or perhaps negative, um, or does the waterfall of positive responses create the encouragement for getting refugee and migrant stories to be more commonly heard? Do you want to, Zainab, do you want to say anything, or I don't want to keep speaking if there's anything you want to offer, but. I, <laughs> have you had, have you had um, then let me ask you a direct question. Has it, have you had any negative responses? Because I, I know it happens to, from people about you speaking out or, or your experience. Um, I had, I had a couple comments when I tell my story as a video. Mm -hmm. And I feel bad, but like when I see more people supporting like and answering that comment so i feel like i feel more comfortable you know right so i certainly so my background again is working in a community of lewiston maine in the early 2000s when there was an abundance of negative comments and attacks towards immigrants and refugees in my hometown and so i'm very familiar unfortunately with how vitriol people can be and and, and difficult um, I think it's a responsibility for those of us, again, to help whoever is telling their story understand the context of which they're going to be telling it. When Zainab goes to speak to a suitcase stories event where people are buying tickets, I can tell her it's a pretty supportive audience. Like, I'm going to be surprised if someone's buying a ticket to hear your story and then be mean to you. But when Zainab goes to schools with me, I talk about where that school is and what the demographic is going to be and that there might be people in this audience that are being made to go because by their teachers that may be a little bit carry prejudice or carry some misunderstandings and that we have to be open to those questions or those comments and that we will navigate them and so she knows that i'm her ally in this and that it might happen now we shouldn't be not going places and not telling stories because we might come to the negativity what we need to be doing is thinking about what stories are we presenting that hopefully in some small way will shift thinking. This is why when BR um, from last time goes with me to schools, he's a, South, he's a Sudanese refugee who is a very dark African man telling stories. He could go in and talk about the severe violence and trauma he saw. <clears throat> he and I have had a lot of conversations about this. Now that's something that these young people need to know. But it also reinforces stereotypes for some people when they think of Africa. So I said, what story do you think you could tell that would change their idea of stereotypes of African men? And that's when he said, well, why don't I tell stories about education? Because him talking about the importance of school to other students who are in school means that his, he has one less degree of disconnect from them. And we've found that that's really worked. So it comes back to this um, really thoughtful decision you need to make about what stories are you telling? And what stories are going to be harder for someone who's anti-refugee to challenge because perhaps they'll see themselves in the story more? I don't know if that answers the question, but yeah, no, I think it um I think it answers it well. And yeah, you had mentioned that being an important thing to any story, is it being um relatable? relatable. Um, and let's see, we're just um reaching the end of our time together. Um, and I do want to thank both of you so much um for being together with us, um, Zainab and Cheryl, for this lunch and learn. Um, and you know, Cheryl, at one point in time, you had um, talked about, yeah, just creating a greater sense of community. And I feel like through this whole series, I appreciate you uh, helping us learn how stories can create the greater sense of um, community. And I know just the thing, a few of the things that you led us through, um, you know, like picking different moments or objects and everything. I, I think I may have added to my story library, maybe. I, I hope that a lot of attendees um, have. Um, and yeah, and Zainab, at some point in time today, you talked about, I think Cheryl was asking you about maybe what like motivated you to tell your story. And um, you had uh, you had mentioned, um, yeah, like having people live the moment with you, um, which I don't know if we can exactly live moments um, with you, but, but we've certainly enjoyed um, yeah, living some moments with you um, 
today. So thank you for being here here with us and sharing some of your your experiences. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yes, yes. Um, let's see. With that, um, we would also like to hear um, from you all who are joining us today and receive any feedback on today's Lunch and Learn um, and hear any suggestions you have for future Lunch and Learn topics. We ask that you take a moment right now to complete the survey. You can use your phone to follow the QR code on the screen or you can follow the link in the chat and we look forward to hearing from you. Um, you will also receive a follow-up email today with a recording of today's webinar and likely a, a link to uh, Zainab's storytelling um, so that you can hear a little bit more, live a few more moments um, with her. And on behalf of Refugee Welcome Collective, thank you to our presenters and thank you all for joining us today. We hope you have a great rest of your Monday. Bye. Thanks for having us and thanks everybody for tuning in. Thank you.